think you're pretty much straight on. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a terrific program in store for you this evening. And to open the inaugural Grand Strategy Summit, it is my honor and privilege to welcome from New York Dr. Henry Kissinger, America's 56th Secretary of State and 7th National Security Advisor. Thank you for being with us, Mr. Secretary. It is a great privilege for me to be invited to the first Grand Strategy Seminar of the Nixon Foundation because I spent six years of my life working daily with President Nixon and the remaining decades of his life in close contact with him. In a recent book, I describe Richard Nixon as the American president most similar to Theodore Roosevelt in his approach to international politics. Nixon was a strategist who had tried to establish the relationship between American challenges and to find solutions in which progress could be made on key issues simultaneously, dangers reduced, and opportunities enhanced. Richard Nixon became president at a fraud moment in American history. In the years before, there had been three assassinations of major American figures, including the president and his brother. The war in Vietnam was at gone through a communist offensive that multiplied casualties. And it had been going on for nearly 10 years. The American public was bitterly divided over the war and massive demonstrations prevented public appearances by President Johnson, who had to confine his visits outside the White House to military installations. The Soviet Union and its allies had occupied Czechoslovakia for daring to pursue a autonomous foreign policy. Dialogue with Russia had broken off. Of course, China was totally outside any set of relationships with the United States. The Middle East was in turmoil. The 67 war had altered the map of the region, but no alternate system had yet emerged, and the participants in the war were gearing for another conflict. In this situation, with an unsolved Vietnam problem, with crises 
in the Middle East, recent aggression in Europe, hostility with the Soviet Union, and no contact with China. Richard Nixon became president, and he honored me with by appointing me his security advisor. It was a remarkable decision because I had never met Richard Nixon and in fact had been closely associated with Nelson Rockefeller, who was a close friend of mine in the period pre uh, before. <clears throat> so it was an act of courage to make such a decision and it showed something of the way Nixon handled his challenges. Uh, General Eisenhower told me afterwards that he had been appointed to the he had been opposed to the appointment because he didn't think academics could operate at that level of government effectively. I look back on this period of association and leadership by Richard Nixon with great pride because Richard Nixon introduced a concept of strategic thinking to American foreign policy. Early on in his administration, he distributed a memorandum to the various key figures involved in foreign policy making <clears throat> that the president intended to avoid the the approach of it treating each problem on its so-called merits because that would lead to the possibility of aggressors picking out the weakest points and keeping quiet on the key issues. So Nixon believed that the issues needed to be related to each other. And that particularly was true of the Soviet Union, so that the Soviet Union should not be able to alternate periods of so-called peaceful coexistence with periods of confrontation, but rather they would, it would be obliged by American policy to concentrate on issues of great importance to us if they wanted to make progress on issues of consequence to them. And he carried out this policy during his six and a half years in office, uh, starting with the Jordan crisis in the summer of 1970, and then through a series of Middle East crises in which Nixon displayed his characteristic quality, which was composed of two elements. One was that if American security was challenged, 
Nixon would resist at the highest level of power that was not yet nuclear war, but in a series of crises, he went on alert three times during crises in the Middle East. But at the end of that process, he had made it lead to what was another major component, that confrontation was not an end in itself. Confrontation had to have a substantive a political purpose that improved the situation and in which the challenger might develop over time an interest in maintaining the international system. So the confrontations in the Middle Ages led to a series of peace agreements between Egypt and Israel, between Syria and Israel, and between Jordan and Israel, all of which had been prepared by Nixon's willingness to fight over the strategic issues and then to move towards negotiation after the issues had been dealt with. In this process, the Soviet Union at first was extremely challenging, but Nixon increased the defense budget though not as much as he desired because of congressional opposition. And originated a series of weapon systems that became the tools of subsequent administrations and such as uh, land-based strategic weapons and uh, strategic defense. Of one of his signal achievements was the opening to China, an idea with which he entered office. And that too bore the Nixon characteristics of combining strategy with tactical flexibility. Uh, at the time of Nixon entering office, it was considered axiomatic that the relationship between China was destined, destined to be in permanent confrontation. But Nixon calculated that it was not normal and not feasible to ignore one of the largest countries in the world and therefore against wide opposition, he opened a dialogue with China, which became one of the principal elements of his foreign policy. The reason for that was that between the the Soviet Union and China, ideological tensions had developed even prior to Nixon's term in office, 
which how, which accelerated afterwards. And it came to our attention that there were conflicts and military clashes between Soviet and Chinese troops at a faraway place at the Manchurian border between China and Russia. When that report was placed before him, Nixon noted, of course, the fact that a conflict between the two countries would present new challenges to the United States. But he decided first that in a conflict between two adversaries, we would lean towards the weaker against the stronger, even if we had not yet established relationships with the weaker. Secondly, as our policy developed, he issued instructions which basically said that we should place the American interests in such a way that we were closer to Russia and to China than they were to each other, giving us a maximum flexibility. By these methods, he created a situation in which the great issues with which he entered the conflict, the presidency, were settled or approaching settlement during his period in office. He had proclaimed very early in his period in office that the, we would not end the Vietnam War by betraying the people who in reliance on an American promise had sacrificed tens of thousands of their citizens. And he maintained that promise. And he achieved an honorable peace, which could can be defined as follows. In early 1972, Nixon made a series of proposals to the North Vietnamese to end the war on specific terms. Eight months later, after having attempted an offensive, a major offensive, to avoid these terms, the Vietnamese accepted them. We could not maintain the assumptions on which the peace had been made because of the divisions in our country had made it impossible to achieve the military co commitments that were needed to sustain them. But at the end of his term and of its period in office, Nixon had given a new strategy and a new meaning and a new direction to American foreign policy that linked power to purpose and moved America to a position where at that point it was dominating the policy 
in the Middle East had achieved military superiority in the military field and was engaged in meaningful discussions with adversaries which had a rational, rational vision of peace at the end of it. Of course, conditions have changed and the definition of the priority of adversaries has changed with the change in their capabilities. But the basic vision of Nixon of maintaining the values of America, the security of our country. And at, in the context of a world order in which other nations could feel secure and supported to participate, that was his great contribution. And so I want to thank you all for inviting me here. There are many in your group who participated in some of these efforts. And all of you are trying to remember a leader who took over his country in adversity found enormous domestic challenges and emerged from it with a vision and a direction that American foreign policy needs to study and apply. And it was an honor for me to be a contributor to these efforts for which I'd be forever grateful to Richard Nixon. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you for joining us and, and opening the Grand Strategy Summit. Ladies and gentlemen, you've just heard from the seventh National Security Advisor. You will now hear from the 27th. Uh, Ambassador Robert O'Brien also serves as the chairman of the board of the Richard Nixon Foundation, and he will be joined tonight by Hugh Hewitt, who uh, was my predecessor as president of the Nixon Foundation. I can't think of a better group to uh, join Dr. Kissinger in opening tonight's Grand Strategy Summit. Hugh, Robert, please uh, come on up to the stage. Good evening, everyone. Um, Robert and I are old friends, so I'm going to call him Robert, not Mr. Ambassador. But I want to begin by asking him the first day that I visited him and you were in the West Wing in your National Security Advisor office after you had come over from state, the first thing you said to me, I don't know if you remember this, I have Henry Kissinger to thank for this office. Uh, so why don't you tell that story and also your relationship with Dr. Kissinger since we just heard from him. Well, thank you, Hugh, and it's great to be here with you. And, and Jim, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, I, I hope everyone realizes how special tonight is having just had Henry speak to us. Uh, you've just been part of uh, history. I mean, it's, it, it's really something remarkable, and you're going to tell your kids and your grandkids uh, that you heard Henry Kissinger talk about strategy and talk about what he did as his National Security Advisor and Secretary of State. Uh, so uh, I was very fortunate. I, I, I spent time with most of my, success, my predecessors, and... Uh, and they were all very, very kind in offering advice and, and help and that sort of thing. 
My first meeting in the new office, I, I think I took office on a Wednesday, Condi Rice uh, flew in and, and came to see me on a Sunday. I think it had been her first time back in the office for, for many years. And we sat and chatted. It was somewhat surreal to be sitting there with Condi Rice and, in her old office. And, and we got done talking. She gave me a lot of great advice. And she said, when you see Henry, when are you going to see Henry? And I said, I'll see Henry next week. And she said, thank him for the office. And I said, okay, why am I thanking him for the office? And she goes, he'll tell you the story. And so I, I was up in New York for the younger. Henry walked out. I went to see him at his, at his home, his apartment. He walked out, and the first thing he said is, good job on Pottinger, who was my, <laughs> my deputy who I had announced. Uh, and the next thing he said is, you and I are the only two who face this. Uh, uh, let me talk to you. And, of course, that was the, the impeachment issue because President Trump was on the verge of being impeached at the time. So he gave me some great uh, counsel and, and shared his wisdom with me. And I said, hey, I want to thank you for the office. Connie recommended that I... I Express my appreciation, and he said, they all do. And I, I said, okay. I said, well, what happened? I won't imitate Henry the rest of the time. It, it, I don't do it justice, but uh, he said, well, I got to the office, uh, and they had me in the basement of the West Wing, and he said, that was unsatisfactory. <laughs> and I said, okay. So he, he said, so I walked to the main floor, and he said, there's the Oval. Of course, that's the president's office. And he said, and there was a vice president's office. I couldn't take that. And the chief of staff, the same thing. But he said, this office held the press secretary. And uh, I said, so how, how did you get it? He said, I told him to depart. It was a matter of national security. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was Ron Ziegler at the time. And I said, what did he do? He said, he left. <laughs> and I said, what about all his stuff? And he said, I had the Secret Service remove it immediately. <laughs> on national security grounds. <laughs> so, so Henry got that office, and it's been the National Security Advisor's office ever since. It's now kind of part of the, the lore of the West Wing. And as I left uh, office on January 20th, 19, 2021, Susan Rice, another one of my predecessors, had been named the Domestic uh, uh, Policy Council Director, and so her office was up on the third floor. But she'd spent four years down in what we call Henry's office, and I looked at Jake Sullivan, and I said, look, Susan Rice is going to have her eyes on this office. I said, Henry got it for us. Do not lose this office. And uh, that was the last thing I said to Jake. He said, I'll keep the office for us, Robert. And, uh, and so that's, that's the story. But, but what, what, a, what a great man. And, and he became probably the person I spoke with of my, my predecessors the most. I talked to him probably every month and, and benefited from his wisdom and, and guidance and counsel uh, throughout the time I was in office. I was not there, but I want to salute you and Jim Byron, the president of the foundation, for the gala you held in, in California on behalf of Dr. Kissinger. For those who were not there, do you just want to quickly review what that dinner did to honor Dr. Kissinger? Well, we held a dinner, and, and look, there's a lot of things. I think Charlie's here and, and, and Ling and, and, uh, and Jim Byron. I had very little to do with it other than showing up with, with my wife, Law Marie, and, and we, we enjoyed the gala like many of you who were there. Uh, and it was a special evening to, to honor Henry for, for his contributions to keeping our country safe and, and to American national security and his contributions to President Nixon. And, you know, one of the things that's amazing about Henry is he never fails to, to recognize uh, that, and has a humility, and we, that's not, not always a word associated with Henry Kissinger, but uh, he, he's got the humility to, to realize what we all do in that job is that you're there to staff the president. And he always recognizes President Nixon's legacy and President Nixon's legacy and, and leadership as he did tonight. And, uh, and he did, did so again at the gala. I thought it was really a, a terrific, uh, he gave a tour de force uh, speech or, you know, the, the, the good and great were there. And, uh, and we were very, very blessed to have him come out to Yorba Linda and a very special evening. And before I turn to the, the substance, I just want to recognize for those of you who did not hear earlier when Jim was an announcing, Trisha. Nixon Cox is with us tonight. It must be, please stand up, Tricia. With Ed, and, and it must be wonderful and also somewhat um, unique to hear Dr. Kissinger talk about your father that way. And I was thinking about you as he was talking now to national security. It'll be all day tomorrow, but I don't get a national security advisor very often. Dr. Kissinger talked about China and how the relationship has changed to the point. Will the Chinese Communist Party order an attack on Taiwan in the next two years? 
Look, it's, it's the number one security threat we face as a country. Uh, Taiwan is very important for us for a, a number of reasons. First, geopolitically, it's critical. It's, it, it holds a, a key spot in the first island chain. And if, if that island gets taken over, it's a large island. If, if it gets taken over by China, it divides our allies in the north, Japan and South Korea, from our allies in the south, uh, New Zealand, Australia, the Philippines, uh, uh, Thailand, our treaty allies, but, but also other partners like Vietnam. Number two, it's kind of like the cork in the champagne bottle of the Pacific. So if you pop Taiwan out and, and give that to the Chinese, the PLA Navy can pour out into the entire Pacific, you know, from the coast my, where I live in California, all the way up to Alaska, to Hawaii, all the islands in the south, the islands you know, many of our, our grandfathers and great uncles fought for. Uh, they'll have free reign in the Pacific. Number two, the, the island contains a chip manufacturer called TSMC and a whole ecosystem of, of chip manufacturers uh, associated with TMSMC, which make 95% of the advanced computer chips that we use, not only in our military products, but in our cars and in smartphones. Uh, if China takes Taiwan and takes those factories intact, which I don't think we would ever allow, uh, they become the, they have a monopoly the, over chips the way OPEC has a monopoly, or e even more than o the way OPEC has a mon monopoly over oil. And number three, Taiwan's a democracy. Taiwan, the people of Taiwan share our values. It's probably the most exciting story that's happened with a democracy in, in the last 30 or 40 years. They went from an authoritarian government uh, to, a, to a full, true democracy. The people there are wonderful, they share our values. It's probably the closest place in Asia to the United States. I know many of you have visited Taiwan and, and know what a great place it is. And, and to see their, their human rights, their democracy snuffed out because Xi Jinping wants more glory for himself uh, would be bad for the human spirit. Put aside geopolitics, put aside the, the tech issues. Uh, it would be a terrible thing for this world to have that, that light of democracy snuffed out. And yet that's one of the reasons, probably maybe the most motivating reason that the CCP and Xi Jinping want to take out Taiwan is because it shows the Chinese people, just like West Berlin did to the, the German people and, and, uh, and, and in some ways uh, South Korea you know, does for the North Koreans, that there's another way that the, the Chinese people can are, and the Chinese culture is compatible with democracy, with capitalism, with free enterprise, with free men and free women. And so that, that, that's a challenge to the Chinese Communist Party that they, they can't continent and, 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 and they want to destroy Taiwan. So for a number of reasons, uh, Taiwan's critical. As to your question about when China would attack, uh, Admiral Phil Davidson, our former commander of Indo-PACOM, uh, the combatant commander there, said he thought it was an eight-year window. He thought 2028, 2029 was the limit at which Xi would uh, seek to attack. I went on TV recently, uh, maybe a year ago, and on Larry Kudlow's show. I said, I think the Davidson window has shrunk. I think it's down to two years. I think they're going to move because they perceive, not necessarily accurately, but they perceive America to be weak right now. And, and they don't want a new president to come in. They don't want a Ron DeSantis or a Donald Trump to return or a Mike Pompeo uh, in office uh, at the time that they, they seek to coerce the reunification with, with Taiwan. So. I think having watched uh, Afghanistan and, and some of the moves we've made, the lack of energy independence that we have, uh, and some of the other failures of, the, of this administration, they believe they have a very narrow window to, uh, to make a move on Taiwan. I hope I'm wrong. I, I pray that I'm wrong. Uh, but but it's, uh, it's, it's probably the biggest national security threat we face as a country right now, Hugh. When you and Secretary Pompeo convened the Nixon seminar monthly, uh, moderated by Mary Kissel, who I think is over here. Hello, Mary. You often talk about China, but I have not yet heard it discussed. How do we deter, can we deter China from any aggression? Yeah, so, so again, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not as complex a strategist as uh, Henry Kissinger is, and uh, I, I'm, I'm a little more simple. Uh, I, I don't feel too bad about that because I spoke with Jim Baker recently, and uh, Secretary Baker we were talking about Henry, and he said, well, Henry didn't think that I, he thought that I was too practical, and, uh, and, what, and he, I think he used, not very complicated. Uh, Henry also said that Jim was a promising young man <laughs> and uh, had a big future ahead of him. Uh, but uh, look, peace through strength works, and it works for the Chinese. And I, I, I saw it when we were in office. We saw it from, with, with President Nixon. We saw it with President Reagan. Uh, we saw it with President Trump. A strong America deters our adversaries. Well, because they don't want to lose. And with, with authoritarians and dictators and tyrants, 
if they lose a war, they go out the side door. It doesn't end well for them. And so what we can do is rebuild our Navy, rebuild our, our Air Force, make sure that General Berger is doing a great job with the Marine Corps with his new littoral combat regiments uh, that are being fielded soon in, in the South Pacific. One of the things that we worked on very hard over the last two years of the Trump administration was making sure we had hypersonic weapons to counter the Chinese hypersonic weapons. Those will be deployed in the next year or two. Uh, but, but a strong America will deter China. It's paradoxical, but weakness or even perceived weakness and appeasement actually invites aggression because our adversaries believe there's an opportunity uh, to make a move and, and to get away with it. And so we've got to take a very strong position and, uh, and the Taiwanese have to play their part as well. The Taiwanese, like the Germans, like some of our other allies, ha have gone a long time uh, coasting on the, the, the security guarantees of Big Brother America, uh, all of you, the taxpayers of this great country. And, and they've, they've managed to have a low defense budget because they knew America would, would have their back. We still need to have Taiwan's back, but Taiwan needs to move up. They're, they're talking about going to 2% of their budget for defense spending. They need to go to 4 or 5 or 6%, given China is across the, the strait from them. And, and, and Taiwan's going to have to play its part as well. One related question. This morning, for those of you who read the Washington Post, um, Senator Rubio reelected on Tuesday. Mike Gallagher is a protege of Ambassador O'Brien. Uh, on the Scott Walker campaign, co-authored a piece about TikTok in which it says the United States is locked in a new Cold War with the Chinese Communist Party, one that senior military advisors warn could turn hot over Taiwan at any time, yet millions of Americans increasingly rely on TikTok, a Chinese social media app exposed to the influence of the CCP to consume the news, share content, and communicate with friends. Now, I'd like your thoughts on that, on TikTok specifically, but I've told my daughter my grandkids can't be on it ever because it's just a file creator for the CCP. But we also have to keep our tech edge without letting them run away with our economy. So how do you balance the need to keep Chinese tech out and American tech up without crippling American tech or allowing them into anti-competitive practices? Yeah, so that's a great question. There are kind of two questions there. Let me address TikTok first. At the end of the Trump administration, we banned TikTok. Uh, TikTok's pernicious. Uh, it's been disclosed over the past several months uh, publicly, so I'm not speaking out of school now, that TikTok assembles vast amounts of information. If you have TikTok on your phone, everything on your phone belongs to TikTok. Uh, you've signed off on the, the terms of use of TikTok. You've voluntarily given them access to all your passwords, uh, everything on your iPhone if you've got TikTok on it. Bad idea. Uh, we knew that, and we also knew that the Chinese Communist Party could access TikTok, and it's now come out in the press uh, that the, the CCP has ordered TikTok to provide information uh, that they have in their files on American users. The other thing that was extraordinarily worrisome is a report that, that was out, and again, this is open source uh, information, that, that TikTok has been tasked with tracking the exact whereabouts of certain Americans. And they can do it, if, if you've got TikTok on your phone, they can track where you are. Now think about this in the context of a, of a pending conflict. If, if China moved on Taiwan, uh, a lot of our young people in the, Marine, in, the, in the armed forces use TikTok. Everyone's addicted to it. They'll have access to who our aviators are, where they are, where our surface warfare officers are. Maybe, and if they don't have access to them, they've got access to where their kids are. And, and you know, the, the, the amount of, of trouble that the Chinese could, could cause with, with cells here in the U.S., with cells in Japan, uh, Taiwan, other places, and the adverse action they could take. They don't need to shoot down the plane if they take out the pilot. And if they know exactly where the pilot is, that becomes very easy. Huge concerns on that front. The last thing I'll mention, we were, Lomer and I had dinner with, uh, I won't mention his name, but uh, he's a friend of many people here, one of our great tech titans uh, uh, on our side of the aisle. And uh, he won't let his kids, he's got uh, two young kids, he won't let them on a tablet. He won't let them anywhere near TikTok because TikTok's algorithms are designed in China to celebrate spelling bees, math contests, patriotic events, and the algorithms here are a program to promote drug use, partying, uh, alcoholism, uh, political uh, dissent, or, or, or um, uh, uh, disputes among, among people. So the algorithms are different algorithms for TikTok here and in China. In China, they promote good civic values. Here, they, they appeal to our baser instincts. So just for, for many reasons, it's a terrible product. Uh, WeChat is right there, Weibo, Alibaba, uh, the whole panoply of, of Chinese high tech uh, is designed to ensnare Chinese expats. 
and, and us in, in, a, in a nasty web that's controlled ultimately by Xi Jinping. Uh, we've got to ban it. The Indians banned it, and it needs to, it needs to be gone immediately. So I, I fully endorse uh, Mike Gallagher's efforts and, and Senator Rubio's efforts. They were both reelected. They're both the future of the Republican Party. Uh, great, great men, and, uh, and they understand the, the, the TikTok issue. Again, we banned it at the end of the administration. The new administration came in, kind of like the reversal of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. They reversed TikTok, and uh, we need to get back to banning the apps. Uh, so I think the second part of your question is, what do we do about big tech? And, and look, big tech's an issue. Uh, no one's happy with big tech on the left, on the right. Uh, no, on the right, people don't like censorship. On the left, they talk about disinformation. Uh, that folks don't like the way that our, our personal data, our private data is being treated by big tech. So there are a lot of concerns about big tech. And, and I understand those concerns and I share them. But the big issue is right now, of the 20 largest tech companies in the world, 10 of them are based in Beijing. The way that we stay ahead in the, in the, in the war, or the, 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 the competition with China, is by having an edge when it comes to tech. Quantum computing, uh, AI, machine learning, 5G uh, space. All of that is driven, Hugh, by our uh, private sector companies. You know, when, when NASA couldn't get people back to the space station, it was Elon Musk and, and, uh, and Elon, not a client, I'm not doing an ad for Elon, but, uh, <laughs> but, but for SpaceX, they got, it was a private sector. Uh, Jeff Bezos, again, not a client, uh, uh, Jeff Bezos has done a, a, you know, a great job on, on his, his space program. Uh, that, that's what's getting us back. When the Russians invaded Ukraine, it was Elon Musk taking his private satellites, positioning them over Ukraine, and then delivering in 24 hours, which some, which everyone said was impossible, the uplink stations to allow the Ukrainians to communicate with the folks in the battlefield, but also communicate outside of, uh, of Ukraine. Uh, YouTube got uh, Zelensky's speeches into Russia on their YouTube channel because Russia, YouTube is so popular in Russia that even Putin didn't want to shut down YouTube. So, they, so the Russian people have their, their access to the outside world. It's through YouTube, which is, a, a, I believe, a, a Google subsidiary. So big tech is a, is a major advantage for us. We've got to deal with the problems of big tech, but we've got to do it with a scalpel. You know, right now there are, are a number of pieces of legislation that would you know, break up big tech, that would destroy big tech. And we, we went through that once before. It was when we broke up AT&T and we lost Bell Labs, that one of the greatest research facilities in the history of man. And, and now we don't have, you know, now we've got to rely on Ericsson and Nokia uh, because we don't have a competitor to compete with Huawei for 5G. We, we can't have that same uh, result with tech. And, and la the last thing I'll say is, look, I think the market's taking note and the market's working. And, and the market always works slowly. But you've seen uh, Twitter being bought by Elon Musk. Uh, you see the, the stock price of Netflix collapsing because you know, individual people decided they didn't want to watch documentaries from the Sussexes, and uh, as, as interesting as they are as a couple, uh, and, uh, and, and Netflix stock has suffered. And we're seeing a number of, of, of conservative uh, uh, Twitter alternatives. None of them are really taking off in a huge way, but I think last month the True Social was the most downloaded app on Android. So, so the market will catch up. So we ought to deal with our tech companies uh, and deal with the specific issues with them, but not destroy them, because otherwise tech is going to be headquartered in Beijing, and we will have zero influence if the CCP is, is in charge of, of the future of big tech, and, and, and we'll lose our competition with China in that case. Let me play off of something Dr. Kissinger said about President Nixon, which is it was President Nixon's view that vis-a-vis -vis China and Russia, we'd be, sh should be closer to the Soviet Union and to China than they were to each other. That's an iteration of Lord Salisbury, It'll always be with the weakest power in Europe. How, we're now not. How do we get back to where we are at least closer to someone, one of those two, or drive them apart? Well, look, it's going to be very hard for us to get closer to China because we, we tried that once. We, we had this idea that if we turned a blind eye to Chinese intellectual property theft, if we let them move all the manufacturing out of America and move it to China, uh, if, we, if we turned a, a blind eye to their human rights violations, whether it was the, the Uyghurs in Xinjiang or the, the annexation of Tibet or the extinguishing of democracy in Taiwan, or excuse me, in, in Hong Kong, uh, the threats against Taiwan, if we just let all that happen, the Chinese would get rich at our expense, uh, but they'd become more liberal, they'd become more democratic, they'd become more like us. I mean, I remember, I'm old enough to remember when Thomas Friedman used to write in the New York Times 
you know, and it was always, I talked to a taxi driver in Singapore, and he is so impressed with the Chinese. And then he would go on a, you know, if I could be, uh, you know, if, if I could be a uh, dictator for a day, like in China, we could have high-speed rail in California. Uh, I mean, fortunately, we've got a, a, a better columnist, Josh Rogan, over there, who's, uh, who's, been one of the few, who's, been, who's been one of the few people who's been willing to shine the light at the Washington Post using his platform there on human rights abuses and, and what's happened in China. And, and th thank you, Josh. God bless you for, for your courageous reporting. Uh, and, and of course, he's, he's surrounded by two of the guys who wrote the best books, Michael Pillsbury and, and Bridge Colby, who wrote great books on China. That's a dangerous table to be at. Uh, so probably, probably doesn't help that I'm sitting next to him. Uh, it's, uh, we're, we're a little bit of a target for China tonight. But, uh, but they, love, they love Dr. Kissinger, so I don't think they'd, I don't think they'd ruin, <laughs> ruin the night. Uh, but look, the idea that we're going to somehow get closer to China and China's going to become more like us just turned out to be a naive hope. And, it, and look, one of the things that's charming and wonderful about America is we have hope, and we are naive sometimes, and, and we, we, we did a lot for China. And it didn't, didn't pan out. We need to recognize it. Now, when it comes to Russia, I mean, what, what do you say about the Russians? They're just difficult. Uh, I mean, and, and they're you know, engaged in war crimes in, in you know, Ukraine, trying to outdo the, the Chinese with their uh, genocide in, in Xinjiang. Uh, but the Russians better watch out for the Chinese because one of the things that Xi Jinping has made very clear is that he's going to recover every inch of territory that China lost during what he calls the century of humiliation when Western powers imposed uh, unfair treaties on China. And probably the most unfair of all of them is the 1860 Convention of, of Peking, or Treaty of Peking, which, by the way, is, is that, that treaty is in the, the Chinese version of it, is in the National Museum in Taiwan, in Taipei. The Nationals took it with them when they evacuated Beijing. That gave Vladivostok and vast swaths of territory in Russia to, uh, to China. And don't think for a minute that the Chinese don't know that, and they are, they're not going to come, especially for a weakened Russia, uh, for that land. And we pointed that out to the Russians on many occasions, and, and, and certainly the Russians are much weaker than the Chinese. Uh, what they've got to do is get rid of this, you know, stop this adventure in, in Ukraine and move those troops back to their eastern border, or they're going to find Xi Jinping, you know, his appetite will only be whetted by Taiwan, and he's going to come for Vladivostok and... and large swaths of, of what's now Siberia or Eastern Russia. And, and I think that's one way we can you know, hopefully bring the Russians back to some reality, is to let them know they face a very serious threat there. Director Ray, uh, Attorney General Barr, Secretary Pompeo, the Vice President, and you gave a series of speeches. Would you recap? It's a great setting for the Grand Strategy Summit because it was an actual exercise in Grand Strategy. Would you explain what happened that very few people recall because it was a laying out of a blueprint? Yeah, so, so a lot of you remember the long memo, uh, Kenan's long memo uh, about Russia and the, the rise of the Soviet Union and the, and the challenge it would present to the United States. Uh, in, in the spring of 2020, uh, it really became clear that we were facing an existential threat as a nation, Hugh, uh, posed by the Communist Party of China. And I want to make it clear, and many of you have been there, the Chinese people, and many of you have been to Hong Kong and, and, and Singapore and, and Taiwan, the Chinese people are terrific. They're hardworking. They're smart as heck. Uh, they're a lot like us as Americans. They're ambitious. They're, they're family people. They've got wonderful traditions. They've got a, a society that's, that's thousands of years old. They're, there's just much to be admired uh, in China and among the Chinese people. But the Chinese Communist Party is, is a totalitarian uh, institution that, that's, that's putting into place for the first time in, in human history, far more than, than the Stasi ever could have dreamed of in, in East Germany, a surveillance society and, 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 a, and, a, and a method to have total control over their people. <clears throat> and it's not just over their people, they want to extend it, it would be bad enough if that, if that was just China, they want to extend it to us. So if the, the general manager of the Houston Rockets puts out a tweet that the, the Chinese Communist Party doesn't like, they threaten to shut down the entire NBA. And, and you, so you've got LeBron James and others kowtowing to the Chinese, saying, hey, that's, that's okay, we didn't really mean what we said about Xinjiang or about Hong Kong, just do your thing, it's all good, please keep paying the license fees to show our games. The Chinese, are, are they tried to do it with, with Top Gun Maverick. They wanted to have the, the Japan and Taiwan patches on, on, on Maverick's bomber jacket, you know, digitally removed. Uh, fortunately, there was enough of an uproar about it that, that, that 
when the movie was, was released, at least in the U.S., it had the, the, the correct patches on, on, on Pete Mitchell's uh, jacket. Uh, but they, they want to extend their reaches into all, all aspects of our society. So we recognize this threat, and we decided to break up our, our views and, and, and talk about it in a series of speeches around the country. Uh, and so my speech was about the, the, the Marxist-Leninist ideology that animates the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, this is not a place like Ray Dalio and others are just, and again, they, they should know better. These are smart men and women, but, but say things like, well, it's a form of democracy. It's not a form of democracy. Xi Jinping is Stalin's heir. And, and when you go to the, if you go to the People's Liberation Army Museum, there's a massive statue of Stalin. They worship Stalin. Uh, they think Stalin was the, the you know, the, the, the gold standard for, for leaders. Uh, you know, and, and so I outlined the, the, the problem, the, the, the ideology that motivated them, and it was a heavily footnoted speech, and it all referred back in, in most cases to Xi Jinping Thought, his book. So when I gave my speech and, and I said this is a marxist leninist uh, uh, country and uh, party, and it's, uh, uh, Stalin is, is the, 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 you know, father to Xi, people got very upset here and said that's provocative. What was interesting is no one in China criticized my speech. They criticized Chris Ray's speech. They criticized Pompeo's speech. They didn't criticize my speech because everything I said came out of, was, was out of their own mouth and they didn't want to be seen as criticizing Marx, Lenin, Stalin, or, or Xi Jinping. So they just said it was anti-China. Uh, but they didn't, they didn't specifically criticize it. Pompeo gave a speech on, on kind of the overall challenge that we face uh, and how we can respond to it. Chris Ray talked about the theft of intellectual property and called it the greatest transfer of wealth in human history uh, from, from the United States going to China, which always, when, when he did it, it made me think of, most of you have probably been to Rome, you've seen the Trajan column, and it's got the wagons on it, loading all the loot from Dacia, that Trajan had been taken from the, you know, what's now Romania, and brought back to Rome and kept the empire going for another 100 years with all the, the treasure he brought back, and that was the, the Romans, you know, uh, celebrated that. I mean, you can imagine a, a column to the, the Chinese leadership from the last 30 years with, you know, computer disks and computers and aircraft and everything, they've, they, the phones and uh, everything they've stolen from us, from our entrepreneurs, from our innovators, taken back to China, deprived us of the value of that wealth and created this great wealth that they're now using for massive military buildup. So Chris Ray talked about that. Bill Barr talked about the, the rule of law and what, that there is no rule of law in modern day China. The vice president gave a bit of an overview to kick us off. So the idea was if you take those speeches together, and they're, they're actually published in a little book uh, I think called Trump on China that we put out towards the end of the administration. It's a, it's a small pamphlet, but the idea was if you took those speeches together, and I think we gave all of them except for the vice president's speech was, was here in Washington. All the others we went around the country. So I, I gave my speech in Phoenix. Uh, Mike Pompeo came out to the Nixon Library with Hugh Hugh and gave his speech in Yorba Linda. Uh, I think uh, Bill Barr went to uh, Minnesota or maybe it was Chris Ray, but one of them went to the Midwest. The idea is we'd go around the country and give these speeches and then t taken together you know, that there was a blueprint of what, A, what China was doing, and B, how we can respond. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, it was during a political campaign, so uh, I think some of the noise of the, the campaign and COVID uh, took, took away from that effort, but I think it, uh, I, I think all those speeches stand this test of time if they're read today a couple of years later. I uh, asked a former senior military official this week a question, and he answered, that gets into classified information very quickly, and I, I know you'll be very aware of that, but my uh, question is based on Director Ray's speech last week. We're making opening one new espionage case a day about the CCP. Uh, were you as astonished as I was as a young DOJ assistant with helping Bill Smith do the American surveillance stuff? And I first saw it, and I was just astonished at how much the Soviets were doing. And it, ta it appears as though the CCP dwarfs their efforts. Look, if you're going to watch the Americans, you know, with what the Russians were doing, and, and uh, Kerry Russell, or Kerry, uh, and, and uh, look, what the Russians were doing was child's play compared to what the Chinese are doing. I mean, you can't even put them, you can't even compare them. I mean, so everything you saw back in the Reagan years, and we thought the Russians were the, the, the Chinese Communist Party, the Ministry of State Security, is infiltrated all over this country. They're, they're infiltrated into, into some of our biggest businesses, uh, especially on Wall Street and in, in Hollywood, uh, the gaming industry. Uh, because it, there's, so, there's, you know, I said there are a lot of houses in the Hamptons that were built with, with Chinese blood money, and and and, and folks are willing to, to mouth the CCP uh, talking points. I don't know how they get the talking points, but they're the exact talking points 
uh, that, that are circulated in China for the CCP members. Uh, they're mouthed by a lot of American business people here. There are spies everywhere. They're in our universities. Uh, we, we had at one point, we, we expelled, I think, 2,500 uh, Chinese students who are studying adv for advanced degrees here because they were all members of the Chinese military. They were PLA officers, PLA Navy officers, PLA Air Force officers, and, and they lied on their applications, on their visa applications, and, and disavowed any connection with the Chinese military. So we expelled them all. The worst part of it, though, was at one point there were more Chinese military officers studying for advanced degrees here in America than there were U.S. military officers studying for advanced degrees here in America. So, I mean, it's, we, we've got a big challenge here. There's been a, some continuity with the Biden administration on our policies and, and on China, and I, I appreciate that. But one of the things they did, they shut down some of the DOJ and FBI programs that were targeting this espionage uh, on the idea that somehow it was, you know, it didn't, it didn't work with their identity politics. But, but I, I, one thing I guarantee you is patriotic Chinese Americans, and there's, gosh, we've got no better immigrant class and, and no better people than Chinese Americans who are here. I, I come from California, and unfortunately one of my good friends, Lan He Chen, ran for controller and, and lost. But we've got such a great group of, of Asian American and Chinese American immigrants here. They don't want the CCP here any more than anyone else does. And, uh, and, and we need to use those, those, those immigrants to, to help us. And they're the ones that, that left China because they don't want to be part of that total surveillance society. You know, they're the ones who can be helping us uh, root out this Chinese uh, infiltration of the country, but it's, it's pervasive. All right, I want to move to um, Iran and Russia. The week started interesting with me. I, I interviewed once in future Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu for an hour because his new book, Bibi, My Story, just came out, and he's only allowed to promote it when he's not Prime Minister, so he's got like a two-week window. So I, I read this book in 48 hours and spent an hour talking with him. The most thing that stuck out at me is that Iran has only not been working on a nuclear program for the one year following President Bush's invasion of Iraq. They stopped for one year, and now they are close with Russia. And that is a deeply, the drones are killing Ukrainians as we speak. What do we, what do, we do about that JCPOT, JCPOA 2.0 that is attempting to be birthed even as we speak in Geneva? Yeah, so, so one of the things that, th there's been a lot of continuity between the, the Trump foreign policy and the, the Biden foreign policy, and I appreciate that. But one area where there's no continuity is with the JCPOA, uh, and that's the, the Joint Comprehensive Memorandum of Understanding that we had between the uh, uh, Agreement of Understanding between ourselves and the, uh, the Iranians and, and a couple of European powers back during the Obama administration. And the idea was, we're going to free up $150 billion in sanctions relief. We're going to pay millions or over a billion dollars for hostages. We're going to give Iran all this money, and they're going to become a responsible stakeholder in the Middle East. They're going to help us in the Middle East. In fact, they're going to help us get out of the wars in the Middle East, and they're going to help bring peace and, and prosperity to the region. And you'll, you'll remember President Obama's inaugural address where he said, if you'll unclench your fist, we'll reach out our hand, and we'll, we'll be partners in this. Now, how did that work out? The, the, they got paid for the hostages over a billion dollars, 400 million of it in cash, which they all split up like a bunch of gangsters. And they took, they took four more hostages to replace the ones they gave us. They took the $150 billion in sanctions relief, and do you think it went to the middle class of Iran uh, to, to help the people of Iran? It went to the Houthis and their war, their civil war in Yemen. It went to Khatib Hezbollah and their civil war in Iraq. It went to Hezbollah to hijack the government of, of Lebanon and, and really destroy the government of Lebanon. Uh, it went to Hamas. It went to for suicide bombers. All of that money was spent to promote Iranian you know, hegemony in the region and, and terrorist activity. It was a terrible deal, and the Iranians kept working on their nuclear program and, and, hit, and hit all their documents. The Israelis had a very stunning and, and daring uh, intelligence operation that, that went and got all that information and brought it back to... Uh, to Tel Aviv, I mean, it was one of the, probably maybe the greatest hit operation in the history of Mossad. So, <clears throat> look, the Iranians don't respect uh, the, the JCPOA. Was such a great deal for them. Of course, they'd want to go back into it, but they knew that the Biden administration was so desperate to restore the JCPOA, and I, I, I never understood it because it didn't work. I mean, it was demonstrably a terrible deal. We all said it at the time, and instead of learning from it, you know, the, the folks that are negotiating it, they all were involved in it the first time. And I think it's like an article of religious faith. I mean, President Obama didn't have any accomplishments. He had one foreign policy accomplishment, and that was the JCPOA, if you can call it accomplishment, and he had Obamacare. And so I think they're just intent on restoring the JCPOA as, as a gift and an homage to, to Barack Obama. 
and they're doing it with the, using the Russians who are opposed to in Ukraine to negotiate the deal for us. They're using the Russian ambassador to negotiate the deal. Uh, Ukrainian drones, as you pointed out, are, are killing Ukrainians right and left and, and taking out their power systems so that they're going to freeze this winter. And, and the Iranians still have a bunch of American hostages. And, and, and yet we're, you know, we're begging the Iranians to reenter. And the Iranians are tough negotiators. I've negotiated with the, the, the Iranians. I mean, it's like we walked into the rug shop and said, I need that rug and I'll do whatever, I'll pay whatever it takes to get it. And what's the rug shop owner gonna say? He's like, well, that one's not for sale. I'm sorry, that, that's a family heirloom. You know, I can't, I can't do that stuff, but we'll give you anything you want for that rug. And they, they know we're desperate to, to re-enter the JCPOA for, for no demonstrable benefit to the U.S. or our national security or to Israel. Uh, and yet we're, we're begging them to, to rejoin it. And it's, it's, it's probably the greatest failure it's right up there with Afghanistan of the, of the Biden administration foreign policy, unfortunately. I'm coming to Afghanistan in a moment, but um, since you brought up hostages, for those of you who don't recall, Ambassador O'Brien, before he became the National Security Advisor, was the Special Presidential Envoy on Hostage Affairs. Since you left office, more hostages have been taken, including a basketball player in Russia. Uh, what do you think about, you helped get a rapper out of somewhere, I can't remember what that was, but how do we get a basketball star out of Russia? without doing damage to our national interest, but getting her home. Yeah, so, so it'll be my, my grave. It doesn't matter that I was a national security advisor or husband, father. It's going to say, I, I got an ASAP Rocky out of Sweden. That's my, <laughs> the, my, my, my highest, uh, you know, Henry Kissinger got, you know, uh, dealt with the Yom Kippur War and, uh, and, and had the Paris Peace Accords. And I'll, you know, my, my gravestone will say ASAP Rocky released from Sweden. Uh, <laughs> Of course, it's probably the reason I'm national security advisor, so I shouldn't go, you know, so I, so I owe ASAP one, and, and I owe the Swedes one for taking them. Look, all, 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 these, uh, all these hostage cases are different. Uh, certainly ASAP was, it was a unique and unusual one. Uh, I, I would go into court in Sweden, and there was a, a, new, a radio reporter from Denmark, who was kind of the Howard Stern of Denmark, who would yell at me, Mr. Ambassador, are you sending the Navy SEALs to rescue ASAP Rocky? You know? Are you moving a carrier to the Baltic to threaten Sweden for to get ASAP Rocky out? And I thought, no, but maybe that's a good idea. You know, so bring, bring, bring the carrier in. Uh, we, we got him out, fortunately, that week because in, in some ways my job was pretty easy being the negotiator because if, if you didn't have to negotiate with me, you got to negotiate with my boss. And uh, they were always worried about what President Trump might do. And so I, 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 I look like the better option for those negotiations, especially when, on the ASAP case. But... Look, they're, they're all different cases. Sometimes we do a military rescue, which is, was my preferred course of action where we could. Uh, that wasn't always possible because of where the hostages were held, and especially if they were held as a wrongful detainee by a state. It was always very difficult to do a military operation in those cases. Uh, all, with non-state actors, that was our first approach. But the Brittany Griner situation, look, the, the Biden administration has a very good spiha, which sounds like a Dr. Seuss name for, for my old job for the Special Presidential Envoy for Hostage Affairs. Roger Carstens, who worked with us, and he stayed over into the Biden administration. The, the hostage families really wanted him to stay, and I'm glad he did. And he's, had a, he's actually had some, some real success, especially recently in, in Venezuela, bringing, I think, seven Americans home. And I, I take my hat off to Roger. He's done a, a terrific job. And we'll get Brittany Griner home. The Russians want Victor Bout, uh, who's an arms dealer and kind of a Lord of War type guy, terrorist. Uh, we've got Victor. We, after a lo lo long time, the FBI was able to get him in a sting operation. That's basically the deal. But, but the Russians were very careful, and they selected Gr Brittany Gr Griner, in my view, because she covered all of the demographics of the Biden coalition. She's an African-American, lesbian, uh, obviously female. Uh, and, and so it puts a lot of pressure on, on the Biden folks to bring her home. And that gives the Russians a lot of leverage, knowing that they have to bring her home, knowing that LeBron James has come out and said she shouldn't come back to America because we haven't done enough to get her back. Uh, Al Sharpton has complained about why Brittany Griner's not home. So the Russians know they have some, some uh, leverage here. And again, as I said earlier, they're tough negotiators. Henry would tell you this. Uh, and so they're gonna really, they're, they're gonna squeeze as much as they can. But I, I do think Brittany, I, I think the outlines of a deal are there. I think Brittany will come home at some point soon. I don't think she'll spend 10 years in a Russian penal colony, but I also think that Putin is really sticking it to President Biden right now uh, with the captivity. 
We have 12 minutes till 8, so I want to finish with three questions about what I hope is the new Republican majority in the House. It does look that way. We don't know. Maybe by the time we leave, we'll pick up another seat, and it might be next year if we wait for Arizona and California. But, <laughs> and I'm serious about next year in California. Um, Speaker-designate McCarthy has pledged in the Commitment to America to establish a select committee on China. Uh, and if it is, I hope they put our friends Gallagher and Waltz on it, who are members of the Nixon Seminar, and basically get Dr. Pillsbury and Josh and Mary, all everyone. To, what should that committee do if they put that forward? Yeah, so I th th we, we tried this uh, a couple of years ago. In, in fact, uh, Kevin McCarthy, Leader McCarthy, had a, a deal with Speaker Pelosi to have a bipartisan committee on, uh, commission on China or committee on China uh, in the House. And the idea was to look at the challenge posed by China and then to come up with what, what can America do to, to compete against China and, and to deter China from uh, you know, invading Taiwan and, and further threatening U.S. national security interest. Unfortunately, at the last minute, Speaker Pelosi pulled out of that deal. Uh, I think she felt it, it would have favored President Trump in, in the presidential campaign. And, and that's something we really have to get beyond. I mean, there, there are just too many areas where the parties need to work together and we need to get beyond kind of the rank politics when it comes to uh, dealing with our foreign adversaries and go back to the days where you know, kind of our dispute stopped at the water's edge and, and we were united overseas. And that, that may be naive and too much to ask for, but we need to get there. Uh, but I think that uh, the commission will look at you know, what we need, primarily what we need to do uh, to, to rein, reinvigorate a peace or strength approach to, to China. What do we need to do with our Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, Army, Space Force, uh, our intelligence services uh, to deter China militarily I think that'll be area number one. I think area number two, well, what do we do on the, the espionage issue? How do we protect our secrets, our, our intellectual property from theft and, and purloined by the Chinese? Uh, I think they'll look at the origin of COVID, which we never got to the bottom of and, and which clearly came from China, which came from the, the lab. There's no question. This, there was this whole idea even early on that if you said it came from a lab, that was, that was terrible because it was a Trump virus, not a China virus. China has a very serious public health issue. We've had COVID, we've had avian flu, we've had swine flu, we've had, I think, five or six different pandemics come from China since 2000. Uh, when I was in the Bush administration at, at the UN, we were dealing, I think it was avian flu at the time, and everyone was making a run on Tamiflu uh, to, to buy it and stock it up. There's a public health issue in China, and the idea that, well, no, no, it came from a wet market, so it's okay. I mean, that's not okay. I mean, the fact that it came from a market where people consume exotic animals alive uh, and spread disease from there, that, that's not a... That's not a positive for your country. And, uh, but, but I think they'll find that it came from a lab. Uh, and so I think we need to get to the origins of COVID. And then I think we need to go to the Chinese and say, you're the source of all these pandemics and plagues that are hitting the world. You need to cooperate. You need to stop covering this stuff up. And you need to institute proper controls at your labs, you know, have a little cleanliness. Uh, and you've got to deal with the, the, the health issues at these wet markets and other places because we can't, the world can't afford another COVID coming from, from China. And so I think getting to the bottom of, of, you know, the origins of COVID is something the commission will do. So I think there are a whole number of, of things. I think they'll look at the genocide that's taking place in Xinjiang. I mean, we always say never again. And uh, what I thought was the most tone deaf thing I've ever seen and, and just a lack of understanding of, of the world, the Chinese have these vocational or rehabilitation camps for the Uyghur men. They leave the women to be, and move Han males into the homes with the Uyghur women, uh, which is, pretty despicable uh, when you think about it. But these vocational schools are to teach them how to work in the workforce. I mean, they might as well put, you know, Arbeit Mach Frey in the, on, the, on the sign leading into the camp. I mean, they're, they're, they're so tone deaf on this. It's a terrible thing. So I think that I think we'll look at the genocide that's taking place again and, and, and put some meaning behind never again, if, that's, if that, we, we really care about it. So I think there's just a plethora of issues that the commission will cover. I think it will be bipartisan this time because I don't think that Democrats will want to not be on a commission that's set up by the majority, uh, and I think it'll have some legs. Let me conclude by asking you, as someone who has worked three different jobs for President Bush, two different jobs for President Trump, is the chairman of the Nixon Foundation. You get along with everyone in our party, and our party being Republicans. We're both Republicans. I'm glad there are Democrats here. We're not going to ask you to leave. But uh, <laughs> the new caucus will be small in majority, so everyone will have a veto. And some of them are isolationist in a way that we haven't seen since the 30s. How do you persuade, it comes down to beginning with Ukraine, 
and I'm not calling JD uh, an isolationist, he's a friend, he's very suspicious of additional aid to Ukraine, and I'm urging additional aid to Ukraine. What's your advice to the speaker and through the speaker to the rest of the speaker designate and through the rest of the caucus about how they conduct foreign policy as a caucus? Because it's not of one mind. Yeah, so, so it's a great question, uh, and I think one of the things we need to focus on for some of our friends that are more isolationists or might be, you know, folks like Rand Paul who are more skeptical of, of spending money on our military, that, that number one, we have to be efficient, we have to root out waste, fraud, and abuse in the Pentagon, but, and we've got to make sure there's no waste, fraud, and abuse and, and, and ill activity taking place in places like Ukraine. Uh, the Russians have captured uh, some of our equipment, they've captured some of our stingers and javelins. Hopefully they weren't sold to the Russians. I don't have any reason to believe they were. I, and I'm sure they were captured as spoils of war. But the Russians are now sharing those pieces of equipment with the Iranians who will, or, or, or smart people, and they'll figure out how to duplicate them. Uh, and then we'll fa our war fighters will face their own weapons. And so we need to make sure that, you know, as we extend this aid, that we do it in a way that's responsible and help, helps Ukraine, but also protects our national security. Uh, but I think there are two things to, to emphasize for some of the more isolationist members of the caucus. Number one, they want to avoid foreign entanglements. The best way to avoid foreign entanglements is to have a strong U.S. military. You know, we didn't have a war under Ronald Reagan, under a peace through strength president. We had the, the, the military operation in Grenada, which was really more of a hostage rescue for the, the medical students, you may recall. But we didn't go to war under Reagan. We didn't start a new war under President Trump. Because when, when, you're, when America's strong and our adversaries perceive us to be strong, we can avoid war. And, and I think that's something that will appeal to some of the more uh, concerned members of the caucus that, that might have an isolationist tendency. I think the second thing that really appeals to him, Hugh, is, is burden sharing among our allies. And so one of the most controversial things I was involved in in the Trump administration and turned out to be one of our great successes, uh, for many years since, since in fact, I went back and, and pulled the old campaign literature, you know, going back to the, the Reagan 76 run, uh, Every, American, every major American presidential candidate said Europe has to share the burden with us in the defense of Europe. Now, in those early days in the 70s and 80s, it was defending against the Soviet Union. Europe didn't want to, def didn't want to share their, the, the burden with us. They wanted us to defend them while they worked on their economic miracle. And, and again, why not, right? It's like what the Germans always joking and said, Angela Merkel had the best German first foreign policy of any country in the world. They got, they got cheap imports from Russia, raw materials, they sold expensive finished goods to China, and they had America defend them. I mean, if you're German, what's not to like about that? And uh, when we tried to close some bases and move some of our forces to the Pacific, uh, I got frantic calls from, from my colleague, uh, the German National Security Advisor, and he said, if you take out the American base, you know, pubs will close, car dealers will close. I mean, it, it was like a brack round. I had a congressman calling me, you know, from a, uh, you know, some, some place where we're gonna close the U.S. base. And I said, well, well, there's a simple solution to that. Put a German military base in there. You know, spend your own money to prop up those communities and stop taking the American taxpayer money to do it. We want to be with there with, as a partner, but you've got a burden share with us. And, and I think, so, so when we went to the, the NATO negotiations, President Trump was very tough on NATO, Hugh. You remember that? And he, he said, maybe we should withdraw or maybe we should only have an Article 5 commitment to the countries that pay 2%. But he was, it, was, it was relatively, it was unorthodox language talking about NATO, I, I grant you that. And the establishment, the, what, we, what we call the foreign policy blob here in, in Washington, they were hand-wringing and weeping and wailing and gnashing of the teeth and sat in sackcloth and ashes. And uh, I started negotiating with Jens Stoltenberg, uh, the Secretary General of NATO, who's one of the great statesmen in the world today. They're, they're, uh, you know, we have a, a dearth of great statesmen, but, but Jens is one of them. And Jens understood the fact that the American taxpayer couldn't be asked to foot the bill to defend Europe, which has an economy as big as America or bigger. Uh, and, and so, you know, President Trump made my life much easier during those negotiations because it's, you heard what the president said. Now, Jens, what are you gonna do when you go past the cup among the Europeans? Uh, what can you get me so I can take it to President Trump and, and try and get a deal done? Well, we ultimately struck a deal that wasn't as much as we liked, but it was $400 billion in additional NATO spending over 10 years. N nothing like that had ever taken place before. It was an incredibly successful summit. We, had, we went from four countries paying 2% of their GDP for their own defense to 11 countries. You know, and part of that was, I uh, you know, don't want to take too much more of everyone's time because you want to go home and get to bed, but uh, we, we set up a lunch the last day and we called it the 2% Club. And if you were paying 2%, your head of state got to come to lunch with us 
and President Trump was going to host the lunch. But if you weren't paying 2%, you didn't get to come to lunch. And, and we had two countries actually come up to the 2% mark to get the invitation for lunch. I mean, it's like, it's like, like high school. You know, if you want to be at the cool kids table, you got to pay your 2%. If you don't, and, and, and we had one country that was very close to paying 2%, but wasn't quite there. Uh, important ally of America and, and uh, people I love very much, but, but they were just desperate to get at the table. But I said, you're like at 1.96%. You got to come up with that extra 0.4%. And they couldn't do it. And then they, so they, they, they didn't come to the lunch. And they were a little upset they didn't come to the lunch. But the point is, you know, if, if we can get our allies to burden share with us, and, and you know, we, we had a great opportunity to do that with the French in the Sahel and West Africa, where they put 5,000 troops in to fight the jihadists, ISIS, we put in a 900 American enablers. Those are the type of deals that we want for the United States, and I think our isolationist wing will look and see our European, if our European allies care as much about Europe as we do, if they care as much about Ukraine in their backyard as we care about Ukraine, I think that'll be a way to help you know, bring them into the fold on, on some of these issues. One last question about the greatest achievement of the Trump administration, at least in my opinion. Benjamin Netanyahu shares it. He wrote in his book, it was nothing short of miraculous that it happened, and the after effects of the Abraham Accords. What do you think the Biden administration is doing with this gift that you left them, this revolutionary development in the Middle East? So, so look, I think they're doing a, a, a decent job with it. The, the first week, uh, someone at the State Department decided that to, to take the, change the name from the Abraham Accords to the diplomatic normalization agreement or something because uh, it was probably too religious for them. Uh, and the, the problem I had is that, is that it was the, the Abram Accords in, uh, in, in Israel and, uh, and, and Abraham Accords with the, uh, and Abram Accords with the, Abraham Accords with the, the Arab allies. They weren't gonna change the name. So that, that name took and, and took hold in the Middle East and it's been durable and they basically hey, said, this is a peace between us, the Israelis and the United Arab Emirates and the Bahrainis and the Moroccans and the Sudan, Sudan, uh, Sudanese and the, uh, the Kosovars, uh, all basically said, hey, we're in on this thing. We're, we're all in, we're, we're moving forward. So it doesn't really, whether you like President Trump having done it or not, they're the Abraham Accords and they're making a difference in the region. They're helping us uh, put a united front up against Iran, Iran. They brought peace to the region. I mean, you know, talking about TikTok, I'm not a fan of TikTok, obviously. But if you go on TikTok or Instagram and you see bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs taking place in Abu Dhabi and Dubai, who would have thought that would have ever happened? And so, you know, they've been durable. Uh, and I think the Biden administration has recognized it. And they're, they're working on the Abraham Accords and moving them forward and supporting them. What we don't have, though, is the momentum to get more countries involved. And we had two, three, four countries kind of lined up ready to, to join the Accords, including some very big countries. Uh, and that would have been good for the region and good for the world, and, and a couple more out of the region, uh, major Muslim powers out of the region. And, and I think that's been lost because to get a deal like that done, you have to have a point person, whether with, with the Vietnam, the Paris Peace Accords, you had to have a Henry Kissinger on it every day. Uh, we had Jared Kushner, we had Mike Pompeo, we had Steve Mnuchin. Uh, I played a, a small role in, in, in the Accords uh, and, and many others, and it was a priority of the administration. It, I don't think it's a pri I think the, the Biden administration appreciates the Accords, but I don't think it's a priority to add additional countries. I think all the, the work that went into the Abraham Accords in this administration has been you know, channeled into the JCPOA and trying to get a, 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 a peace deal with, with Iran, and w which will basically allow in two years Iran to become a, 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 new, a recognized nuclear power. I mean, it's just mind boggling, but I think all the Abraham Accord effort went into the JCPOA and and we've lost some momentum there. But, but I, I think the accords are durable. I was just in the region. I just saw Prime Minister Netanyahu in the final weeks of his campaign, and uh, he was confident he'd take over. He won. I'm, he's got my congratulations, and he's, he's a great man. And, and, you know, again, like, like Henry, a, a part of history, and who I was fortunate enough to get to know. And uh, I, I think he'll push to move the accords forward with other countries, even if the U.S. isn't there. You know, we'll, we'll see how it works. I want you to join me, please, in thanking the ambassador for joining us tonight. We will turn it over to Mr. Byron, I think, and we will see you here tomorrow for more of this all day. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here tonight. We will see you tomorrow morning in this room for another great day of uh, informative discussions that begin at 9 a.m. Thank you so much for coming, and good night.